Hachette Audio presents Starry River of the Sky Written by Grace Lynn Read by Kim, my guest For Kiki Special thanks to Alex, Alvina, Bethany, Libby, and Rebecca Chapter 1 Randy was not sure how long the moon had been missing. He knew only that for weeks the wind seemed to be whimpering, as if the sky were suffering. At first he had thought the moans were his own, because his whole body ached from hiding in the merchant's moving cart. However, it was when the cart had stopped for the evening, when the bumping and knocking had ended, that the groans began. The sky had moaned and cried for many nights before Rendy finally dared to peek out. When he heard the donkey being led away and the nighttime wails beginning again, Rendy crawled from behind the gangs of wine, huge pottery vessels as big as he was, and poked out his head from the covered cart. Yet when he looked up into the sky, he saw nothing. The stars had dimmed to little more than faded shadows and the mournful noises echoed in the blackness. It was then that Rendy realized the moon was missing. He thought it would appear the next night, or the night after. Rendy was sure the moon would return, as it always had, glowing as if it were cut from the sky with a pair of sharp scissors. But it did not. Every evening, after the merchant had left, Rendy crept from the stifling, sticky cart, into the fresh night air and peeked up. And every time, the starry river of the sky was empty. You must have wine, a voice said. The merchant. In the cart, Rendy froze. Another moonless night had passed, and the darkness inside the covered cart had thinned with the morning's arrival. The hitching of the donkey had jerked Rendy awake, his head knocking against one of the clay vats but it was the sound of voices that alarmed him. It is the day of five poisons. I can sell you a gang, the smooth voice of the merchant said. I own an inn, not a tavern, another voice replied. I don't need a gang of wine. That is too much. Ah, but having some wine stocked does not make your place a tavern, the merchant replied. You offer tea and food in the dining room of your inn, do you not? Offer wine as well, and your guests will gladly pay. I just need enough wine to protect us from the noxious animals, the innkeeper said. For me to drink and to write the wedding symbol on my daughter's forehead. One jug will be fine. But it is the famous sun wine, the merchant said, and I can give you a very good deal. Sun wine, the innkeeper said. Rendy could hear the hesitation. Don't buy any, Randy begged silently, trying to quiet his thumping heart. Don't open the cart. I can sell it in the city for a high price, but it has been so hot that I'm afraid the wine may spoil before I get there, the merchant continued. You can see I've even had to cover my cart. It's better for me to sell you some now. We can include my last night's lodging in the cost. As noiselessly as possible, Rendy scrambled to the back of the cart, while the men outside agreed on a price. Rendy squeezed between the two gangs, farthest from the opening, the huge clay containers compressing him like meat in a dumpling. The cart opened, and Rendy clasped his bag close to him, feeling the hardness of his rice bowl through the cloth. The merchant and the innkeeper struggled to remove a gang, rocking the cart back and forth. Rendy scarcely breathed, and the men grunted as they pushed and shoved. Neither noticed the small figure well hidden in the shadows of the remaining gangs. With a rude curse from the merchant, the vat finally dropped safely to the ground with a thud. Both men leaned against the cart, and the sun glinted from the back of the merchant's bald, perspiring head. As the innkeeper sighed from the exertion, Rendy slowly let out his breath. Safe, Rendy thought as he listened to the men finish their deal. He closed his eyes in relief. What's that? the innkeeper said. 
Randy's eyes flew open. Hands and arms reached toward him, grabbing and pulling. He squirmed and struggled, but there was no escape. Randy was roughly dragged out of the cart, and soon he was staggering and squinting in the bright daylight. A stowaway, the merchant growled, his friendly manner disappearing. The merchant was wiry and sun-brown, and his hands were as strong as iron chains. One hand clamped the back of Randy's neck in a relentless grip, while the other rose to strike him with a vicious blow. Randy cringed, but the innkeeper grabbed the merchant's arm before it struck. He's just a boy, said the innkeeper, who was shaped a bit like a jug of wine himself. He doesn't look much older than my daughter. You can have him then, the merchant said with an unkind laugh. He shoved Randy to the ground. As Randy coughed up dust and the innkeeper helped him to his feet, the merchant quickly closed the cart, climbed into the driver's seat, and grabbed the reins of the donkey. Didn't you say your son left? He mocked. Take this one. He's included with the wine. But, the innkeeper said as the wheels of the cart spit dust at him. But, swiftly, the merchant drove away, deaf to the innkeeper's stammers. The innkeeper gaped from the cart to the boy, and then the cart again. The boy clung to his cloth bag, and the cart blurred in the distance. The innkeeper stared blankly at it, and when the merchant and his cart finally disappeared into the flat line of the horizon, Master Chow, the innkeeper, was still staring. Chapter 2 Rendy's muscles were as soft as uncooked tofu, and his face as friendly as an angry tiger. But Master Chow said finally, I do need someone to help with the chores at the inn. A chore boy, Rendy scowled with scorn. But then he saw the long, wide, empty road in front of him, and the dust from the merchant's cart floating in the air like a fading ghost. The grass was yellow and withering, and a quick scan around showed... Besides the shabby inn, a handful of broken-down stone houses. There's nothing here, Randy thought with shock. Where am I? What kind of chores, Randy said, forcing the words from his mouth. He would stay for now, he told himself, but just for now. Well, first, Master Chow said, I need you to help me bring this wine into the inn. Randy was not much help moving the wine. He could not get his puny arms around the gang, much less lifted. Master Chow grunted and huffed and panted and had only succeeded in moving the wine a few feet when Randy said, If we put it on its side, we could roll it. Master Chow stopped and said, What is your name? Randy. Well, Randy, Master Chow said, that is a good idea. Rendy's dark frown lightened. They tilted the gang and slowly rolled it into the inn, the hot sun burning their necks. But when they brought the wine into the back storeroom, a small figure ran in like lightning, and Rendy's scowl returned. It was Master Chow's young daughter, Pei. Her round face still showed remains of her breakfast, and the bottoms of her pant legs were brown with dirt. Rendy wrinkled his nose, looking at her as if she were a worm in a half-eaten peach. Who's that boy? Pei asked, stopping in mid-stride. That's Rendy, Master Chow said without turning. He was mixing Rialgar powder into a small bowl of wine. Rendy is going to take over some of Jiming's chores. Rendy, this is my daughter Pei. Rendy sniffed and rolled his eyes away from her in contempt. Pei's eyes narrowed. However, Master Chow seemed not to notice and brought Pei in front of him. He gently pushed her tangled hair from her cherry blossom pink face. She stood as still as a carved statue, with only her eyes moving, as her father dipped his finger into the wine mixture and carefully wrote Wang, a symbol of power, with it on her forehead. Randy watched from the doorway, and a strange, jealous anger filled him. That should protect you from the noxious animals, Master Chow said to her, and sighed. Day of five poisons already. Spring was hardly here, and now it's summer. Pei didn't answer, 
for her eyes were glued on Rendy in the doorway. He had been making rude faces at her, pretending to be each of the five poisonous animals. Snake, scorpion, centipede, spider, and toad. His last impression was of the noxious toad, which he made by bulging his eyes and sticking out his tongue. Why is that boy here? Pei said, her lips pursing. I told you, Master Chow said. With Jimin gone, we need someone to help with the chores. We don't need him, Pei protested. Jimin will come back. Master Chow sighed again, this time a heavy sigh that fell like a stone in water. Your brother made his decision, he said, standing up stiffly. Without another word, Master Chow walked out of the room. Peiyi stared after her father with forlorn eyes, and then looked at Rendi. The strange, jealous anger from before had lingered and strengthened, and he jeered at her. Baby, Rendi said, too young to drink the wine, so you have to wear the wang sign. Watch out for the noxious animals. Peiyi glared. Horrible, she hissed at him and ran out of the room. Chapter 3 To Rendi, this small village of clear sky and its inn were horrible. Pei was forced to show him everything, and she fumed with anger as he sneered at the rough wooden floors, the humble and broken-down houses, and the yellowing weeds dying between the rocks and the walls. The only thing Rendi could not scorn was the strange, endless plain of stone that lay beyond the inn. The smooth rock ground stretched beyond sight, as if someone had wiped away part of the landscape with a rag. What is that? Rendy gasped in spite of himself. It's the stone pancake, Peyi answered. She was glad there was at least one thing this horrid boy could not mock. My ancestor made it. Made it? Rendy said in disbelief. You're lying. It's true, Peyi insisted. My ancestor was a great man. Your ancestor, my ancestor was the... Randy sputtered and then stopped. What did your ancestor do? Pei said. Mine moved a mountain. Randy bit his lip in frustration. His ancestors were far greater than the ancestors of this dirty-faced girl. But he swallowed his words bitterly and instead said, How? The story of the man who moved a mountain. When this place was called the village of Endless Mountain, my esteemed great-grandfather moved here. He was an extraordinary man. He was so determined and courageous that when he wanted his tea made of Nanling water, he journeyed the hundreds of miles to the Long River and braved the brutal and violent waves to get it. He was so smart and clever that he never lost a game of chess in his entire life. He was so strong and powerful that he pulled two oxen by their tails through the street. So wondrous was my honored great-grandfather that all, even the spirits above, looked upon him with admiration. So, when one fall morning he looked out his window and was displeased, the grounds seemed to join his family with their trembling. I see nothing out my window, my great-grandfather cried. Why can I not see the sky, the sun, and clouds? Honored father, his two sons and wife bowed at his feet. Our house is next to the mountain. You do not see the sky in your room because the mountain blocks it. My esteemed great-grandfather sputtered. I must be able to see the sky. I cannot let the mountain block the heavens. We will move the mountain. He gathered shovels and pails, and he and his obedient sons began to dig. One bucket at a time, they began to carry the mountain away. Obviously, this seemed an impossible task, like emptying the ocean with a rice bowl. Yet my honored great-grandfather was not discouraged, and day after day, he and his sons carried away buckets of earth. All the villagers came to watch in amazement, as my great-grandfather and his sons attempted to move the mountain. Their odd whispers carried to the clouds, and the spirit of the mountain overheard. 
the spirit gazed down at my great-grandfather and his tireless, unyielding shoulders, bearing away stones of the mountain, and was alarmed. The spirit took human form and rushed down. Why are you trying to move the mountain? The spirit asked my honored great-grandfather. To carry it away, bucket by bucket, is that not impossible? Even if you were to live a hundred years and work every day, you could not achieve it. My esteemed great-grandfather brushed away the words. I will move this mountain, he said. If I do not move the mountain in my lifetime, my sons will continue my work and their sons after that. Eventually, this mountain of annoyance will be gone. The mountain spirit heard the truth in my honored great-grandfather's words and began to quake and shiver with fear. Without another word, the spirit left. The next morning, the sun streamed into my great-grandfather's room. He leaped from his bed and ran outside. The mountain was gone. Instead, there was an empty stone field that seemed as flat as a plate and as endless as the sky. My honored great-grandfather stood with pride. He had moved the mountain. And that is why we have the stone pancake. Pei finished. It is where the mountain used to be, before it fled from my great-grandfather's power and wisdom. No one uses it, Rindy said. Nothing grows on it, no one builds on it, and no one travels on it, Pei said, shaking her head. It's so big, if you walk on it far enough, you'll see nothing but the sky and the flat stone and get lost. Sometimes we use a small bit of it near the end for celebrations, like weddings, but usually it is left bare. I can't believe it, Randy said, but the never-ending flat land drew out in front of him, and he could think of no other explanation. The missing mountain is also why this place is called the Village of Clear Sky, Peggy couldn't help adding, because the sky is clear of the mountain. Clear of the moon, too, Randy thought grimly. That evening in his new bedroom at the inn, the moans of the sky returned. Randy clenched his teeth and covered his ears with his hands until, finally, he glared out his window into the dark. Below the groaning of the night, he heard the satisfied snores coming from the bedroom of Master Chow. Was Randy the only one who heard the sky? Was it just in his head? Why wouldn't it leave him alone? Another cry echoed. Stop it! Randy whispered fiercely into the moonless sky. I'm not going to listen to your whining anymore. But the night just gave a mournful noise in answer, and Randy scowled. He would forget about the sobbing sky, the missing moon, everything. He would forget it all. He turned from the window, shutting his eyes. There was nothing to see anyway. Outside, there was only blackness and the poor village of clear sky. Chapter 4 Just like that, Randy became the chore boy at the Inn of Clear Sky. He was not used to doing chores, so when he found a broom in his hand, he had to watch Peggy to learn how to sweep. He watched her so closely as she washed and dusted that she was convinced he was mocking her and said in annoyance, Go clean that room by yourself. As he left, Peggy added, Do a good job. It's the best room in the inn. Just by her tone, Rendy could tell that the room was a point of pride. Instead of plain wood, the couch bed in this room was carved with ribbon-tailed birds and plum blossoms. There was a matching table, and the warm-colored wood shone as if it had just been dipped in honey. Silk scrolls hung on the wall, and lacquered painted gourds stood as vases. Rendy sneered. Best room in the inn, he scoffed to one of the painted peonies. It's not even good enough for one of my father's servants. But as the words fell from his lips, he froze and his face darkened. Without another word, Randy spent the rest of the time vigorously polishing and dusting, flinging the dirt from the window as if to rid the room of any of his lingering words. When he finished, the room was spotless, and even Peggy could not find any fault with it. Wasted work, though, Randy often thought. 
with the exception of old Mr. Shan, who did not even stay at the inn, but just came to eat every day. There were no guests at the inn of clear sky. Rendy watched carefully, day after day, hoping another merchant or trader would arrive so he could leave this poor, pitiful village with its crying sky. It could barely be called a village, really. Most of the homes were empty and abandoned, and the people who lived here now would barely fill the dining room of the inn. Everyone leaves. Villagers, guests, everyone. Even my brother left, Peggy had said sadly to Rendy. But she added with a note of happiness, Even you'll go someday. I hope someday soon, Rendy had thought. But it was not to be today. In the morning, Rendy awoke to the strident crow of the neighbor's rooster and looked out the window. As he expected, the hot sun shone brightly on the undisturbed yard, and there was not a horse or hoofprint visible. Rendy sighed and washed his face. Perhaps tomorrow a guest would come, a guest with a cart he could crawl into. You're late, Master Chow said, as Rendy and Pei walked down the stairs. We have a new guest. A new guest? Pei said in surprise. Rendy was also surprised. The sky's moaning had kept him awake most of the night, and he had heard no one arrive. Did he come in the night? No, Master Chow said. Arrived early this morning, alone, on foot, and paid for a room for a whole month. She said she may stay longer. She? Rendy said. The word spurted from him in surprise. It was unheard of for a woman to be staying alone at an inn, much less one who came on foot and stayed for longer than a night. Yes, Master Chow said, and she wants her breakfast brought to her room. Make sure you ask her if she wants all her meals there. What is she doing here? Pei asked, and for so long. That's not our business, Master Chow said, quickly shaking his head at Pei. She paid for her room and meals. That is all that concerns us. Pei looked at Rendy, but he did not return her gaze. He hoped he looked bored and uninterested, even though inside he was as curious as she was. Chapter 5 I'll help you bring up the breakfast, Pei said to Rendy. He wasn't fooled. He knew she just wanted to peek at their new mysterious guest. But he said nothing and handed her the covered cup of tea. The new female guest was standing at the window in the finest room of the inn, the same window Rendy had flung dust out of. Her back was toward them, and she stood against the yellow sunlight. The darkness of her silhouette reminded Rendy of the moonless sky that cried at him at night. Your breakfast, Rendy said. Madam, Madam Chang, the woman said. Her serene voice seemed out of place in the hot room, already baking in the summer sun. Tell me, Madam Chang said without turning. What did you name the stone field where the mountain was? The stone pancake, Pei said, pleased that this new guest already knew the story. It was my ancestor who moved the mountain. Really, Madam Chang said, and she turned and looked at them. Rendy and Pei gaped. Madam Chang did not look like any woman Rendy had ever seen before. She was not like the painted ladies of the court, who giggled and swayed like flowers as the wind blew. Nor did she resemble a broad-shouldered peasant woman, thick and browned by the sun. Her features were fine and smooth, as if she had been carved from ivory, and the light in her eyes made them shine like stars. She stood with the elegance of a willow tree, and even though she wore the cotton robes of a commoner, both Rendy and Pei felt as if they should kowtow before her. Pei's eyes were as large as lychees, and it took a moment before Rendy realized that they were both staring. Master Chow would like to know if you want all your meals brought to you in your room, Rendy said. It's cooler in the dining room, Pei said, and then with an attempt at a grown-up air. But it's hot everywhere these days. Yes, it is, Madam Chang agreed with a smile. But... At least it's not as hot as when there were six suns in the sky. Six suns? Pei asked. You don't know the story? Madame Chang asked, looking from Pei to Rendy. Both shook their heads. 
The Story of the Six Sons Long ago, so long that only the sky, mountains, and water can truly remember, six suns appeared in the sky. These six suns caused great suffering and devastation to the earth. Rain boiled away before ever touching the ground. The trees and plants withered, leaving behind only the scorched earth burned and brown. All the villagers were forced to live like worms, crowding into an ancient dark hole in one of the hills. As they began to starve, they also began to despair. But then, a rumor began to murmur at night, perhaps sent by the spirit of the mountain above. The one marked with power can save you, it whispered. The one who bears the mark of power can save you. The people looked at one another in confusion until a man stepped forward. His name was Wang Yi, and he was the strongest, bravest, and quickest of all men. He had already done many great deeds. They said he had tamed the flooding water serpent with just the fierceness of his eyes, and he had killed the single-toothed earth giant with his mighty strength. But more than that, Wang Yi had an unusual scar on his forehead. It looked like the character Wang, a symbol of power. It must be Wang Yi whom the spirit of the mountain meant, the people said. The scar is the mark of power. But when Wang Yi stepped on the scorched earth and gazed at the six suns, he knew his strength and fierceness would not help. He had to stand in the shade of the mountain, for the ground lit by the suns burned his feet. Everything on earth was suffering. Even the giant tree next to the mountain seemed to be withering. Wang Yi realized that he could not fight the suns. His only hope was to shoot them down from the sky. So he shot his arrows at the suns, pulling his mighty crescent bow so that it made the shape of a full moon. But no matter how powerfully he pulled, the arrows could not reach. Over and over he shot, until the shade of the mountain disappeared as the suns moved overhead. Finally, with only six arrows left in his case, Wang Yi was forced to dip his feet in water to cool them. He looked down in defeat. It was then that he saw his reflection in the pool. The great lake had shrunk because of the heat, but the shade of the mountain had saved it from completely vanishing. There was still enough water for him to see the six suns reflected in it. I will shoot them here, Wang Yi said, and with his back to the mountain, he quickly placed an arrow in his bow and shot at the reflection of one of the suns. As the arrow flew into the water, a sun sank from the sky. Wang Yi fitted another arrow and shot again. Another sun fell. Immediately, the people felt a change in the temperature. They crawled out from the hole to watch Wang Yi shoot the third sun, and then the fourth. But as everyone cheered, Wang Yi's wife thought quickly. If he shoots all the suns, she realized, we will be forever in darkness. So, knowing better than to disturb her husband's concentration, she crept behind Wang Yi as he prepared his arrow for the fifth sun. With all eyes on Wang Yi, only the mountain saw her, as she silently took the sixth and last arrow from his case and swiftly hid it in her sleeve. As a result, after shooting the fifth son, Wang Yi found his case empty and laid down his bow. This is why there is now one son. Well, that one son is hot enough, Rendy said. The guest room had grown even hotter during the story, and a drop of sweat rolled down his forehead like a falling grain of rice. That is true, Madame Chang said, and she looked out the window at the dry, yellowing earth below. Then she looked again at Pei Yi and Rendi. Please tell Master Chao, I will take the rest of my meals downstairs with the other guests. I think I would enjoy the company. Rendi didn't think Madame Chang would much enjoy the company of old, slow-witted Mr. Shan, the inn's one regular mealtime guest, but he refrained from saying so. Instead, both he and Pei Yi bowed respectfully and left the room. Chapter 6 You couldn't teach a pig how to snore, Widow Yan snapped. I wouldn't have to, Master Chow roared. 
I would just let it follow your example. In the garden, Rendy sighed. He was unsure which was worse, the skies wailing at night or the screeching of Master Chow and Widow Yan during the day, for Master Chow and Widow Yan were fighting yet again. He did not know what caused the first argument between the two neighbors, or when it had been, but every day was full of their quarrels. Rendy returned to his weeding, though truly it was the snails he was tending. The inn's garden was not really a garden. It was a snail haven. As soon as a green shoot sprang from the dirt, snails covered it like a warty plague. Any surviving leaves were also ravaged, and the partially eaten greenery looked like delicate paper cuttings decorating the dark wall. The only garden that was worse was the one on the other side of that wall. Snails also reveled in Widow Yan's garden. Their shells adorned her plants like brown berries. The only things more plentiful than Master Chow's and Widow Yan's snails were their insults to each other. A door slammed, and Rendy saw Melan, Widow Yan's daughter, come out of the house next door, drooping like a magpie with a broken wing. That meant Pei was sure to come out and try to sneak a visit. Rendy knew Pei had formed a secret friendship with the older girl, admiring her like the mother and sisters she didn't have. Melan was pretty and gentle, with long hair tied up smoothly in a woven clasp and skin like a fresh peach. To little Pei, who went about constantly with bruised knees and tangled hair, Melan seemed a fine lady. And sure enough, there was Pei now, taking advantage of her father's distraction, stealing out of the inn and over the low wall. Perfect, Randy thought wickedly, as the girls greeted each other. He began gathering snails and arranging them on the wall. When he was done, Pei would be so annoyed. Have you heard from Jiming? Meilan asked Pei. No, Pei said, her voice suddenly full of sorrow. Maybe he is too busy, Meilan said with a sad sort of laugh. Maybe he is in the city having a grand time with a fine job and a wife. A wife? Pei exclaimed. No, Jiming couldn't get married that fast. One never knows, Milan said with a shrug. He wouldn't, Pei almost shouted, and then she said in a soft voice that made Rendy's ears prickle, and he almost stopped organizing the snails. He wouldn't have forgotten about you. The older girl said nothing and looked off into the distance, as if searching for the end of the scorched stone plain that stretched before them. Rendy continued to place the snails on the wall. So far, the snails just spelled out, Pei. Melan, Pei said, could you show me your wedding jewelry again? Pei's eager eyes made Melan smile. Like a flitting bird, she went into the house, returning with a dark red wooden box with vases of peonies painted on one side. Sitting down, Melan carefully placed the box on her lap and, with an air of grand formality, threw back the lid. Pei squealed in excitement and pleasure. Randy was pleased, too, for now the snails were saying, Pei is a... This will be for my hair, Melan said, fastening a gilded metal comb, ornamented with flowers made of pearls and jewels into Pei's hair. The ornaments sparkled with a hundred rainbows in the brilliant sun. Milan dangled glittering gold pieces. These will be my earrings. Can I see that again, too? Pei said, pointing to an embroidered silk purse. Ah, my treasure of treasures, Milan said, taking it out carefully with grand reverence. I will not get married without it. It was a jade bracelet. As Rendy proudly finished arranging the snails, which now said, Pei is a melonhead, in bold characters on the wall. He looked up and saw Melan holding a simple smooth circle of green, without carvings or extra adornments. The vivid emerald green color shone through to the edges of the bracelet and had a beauty and elegance that even the harsh sun could not cheapen. Rendy admired it more than Melan's ornate hair comb. Now tell me the story, too, Peggy begged. What story? Rendy thought. How could there be a story about a bracelet? It is not much of a story, Melan said. I don't know why you like to hear it so often. I just do, Pei said. 
please? Milan laughed, and Rendy, in spite of himself, listened. The Story of the Jade Bracelet When I was about your age, my father became very ill. He knew he was dying, and one day he called me over to his bed and gave me this jade bracelet. It had been his mother's and his grandmother's before that, and he had been keeping it for me. But now it was mine. It's part of your wedding dowry, he said to me, for when you get married some day. It's very, very valuable, so make sure you take good care of it. Soon afterward, he died, and I began to wear the bracelet all the time. It was too big for me, and it was much too fine to wear every day. But I couldn't help it. It reminded me of my father, and seeing the glossy green circle on my arm made me feel like he was still with me. But my mother would yell at me. You're going to lose it, she said. Put it away someplace safe. I didn't listen to her. Instead, I wore it all day and even to sleep, hiding it under my sleeve so she wouldn't see. But she was right, because one day I did lose it. I wasn't sure when or how, but when I realized it was gone, I felt as if my father had died again. I didn't say a word to my mother, who would have been horrified as well as angry, but just waited until nightfall to sneak out of the house to look for it. Had I lost it when I was feeding the chickens? or working in the garden, or, horror of horrors, when I was getting water from the well. In the moonlight, I searched on my hands and knees throughout the yard, tears streaming down my cheeks. As the moon began to swim in the sky, I started to despair, and I could not help my sniffling. What's wrong with you? a voice said. It was the chow boy, your brother, Jiming. He was sitting on the garden wall in the silver light of the moon, and looking at me as if I were a curious animal. I knew I wasn't supposed to talk to him, because he was a chow, but I didn't care. My misery overwhelmed my pride and anger. I lost my bracelet, I almost wailed. Well, can you stop crying about it? He said, and motioned to the inn where a loud howling echoed. My baby sister has been crying and crying for hours, and I came out here to get away from it. I'll stop crying when I find my bracelet, I said to him. Fine, he said, and he jumped from the wall. He got down next to me and started to help me look. If it's the only way to get some peace here. So we crawled in the grass, like two crickets in the night. Neither of us said much, but even as we searched in silence, I was grateful he was there. I had always been told that the chow boy and his family were awful. But right then, with the round moon glowing above, he didn't seem so bad. And when Jiming found the bracelet next to the sleeping rooster, I knew he was not bad at all. Is this it? he asked, holding the bracelet in the air, so that it mirrored the circle of the moon. I was so happy. I jumped up and hugged him, and then I laughed because he looked so surprised. As soon as the bracelet was in my hands, I ran inside to put it someplace safe, without even saying goodbye. But as I left, we both knew we were friends. I was a baby then, Pei Yi said proudly. My crying helped you and Ji Ming become friends. Yes, Mei Lan said. And we've been friends all these years, though we had to keep it secret from our parents. They probably wouldn't like us being friends either. Pei Yi said. No, Melan said absently. She held the bracelet before her, as if she could see her future through its hole. Softly, to herself, she repeated, I will not get married without it. Pei Yi! Master Chow called from the inn. The fight with Widow Yan must have ended, for now the shouts were for Pei Yi. Where are you? Both girls looked up alarmed. With haste, Pei Yi removed the comb, and Melan put the bracelet back into its pouch and in her box. Then, scampering like a rabbit, Pei Yi crossed over to the inn's yard, running past Rendi and the wall without a second glance. Rendi stared. The wall was blank. His carefully arranged message of, Pei Yi is a melonhead, was gone. For without his noticing, the snails had slowly crawled back to the shelter of the shaded garden, 
leaving only a trail of ooze behind them. Chapter 7 The sun was finally beginning to dip in the sky, and Widow Yan was frying her famous fermented tofu. It was strange how something that smelled so foul could taste so delicious. The joke about fermented tofu was that the more disgusting it smelled, the more delicious it was. Widow Yan's tofu seemed to be proof of this, as an odor reminiscent of rotting garbage mixed with an unemptied chamber pot reeked from it. Rendy could not think of anything that smelled more unpleasant, but he had often seen Melan sneak some of the tofu over the wall to Pei, who ate it with rapture. Rendy brought the teacups to the table, setting them down one by one with a solid thud. With each thump, Master Chow groaned. Oh, my head, Master Chow said, placing the palm of his hand to his forehead. Please, give me some quiet and some peace. Rendy grimaced. He needed peace more than Master Chow. Every day he had to listen to the innkeeper's petty bickering, and at night the sky's crying tormented him. Rendy was starting to believe the sounds were all in his head. Was he going crazy? He tried not to think about it. I suppose one person's noise is another's friendly sound, Madame Chang said, turning to Mr. Shan at the table. Much like the story of the rooster's cries to the sun, is it not? Mr. Shan started, jerked out of his thoughts for a moment. Rendy frowned and rolled his eyes. That afternoon, Rendy had watched when Madame Chang first saw old Mr. Shan, with his long white beard hobbling on his cane through the door. She had gone straight to him, smiling, and took his hand into hers. In return, Mr. Shan had stared at her vaguely, as if seeing her in a fog. Then he shook his head, sat down at his table, where his food was waiting, and immediately began chewing with an absent-minded air. Rendy was surprised how graciously Madame Chang treated such a snub. Her smile waned, but instead of being insulted, her eyes softened, and she sat down next to him, pouring his tea. She had been kind and gentle to Mr. Shan, insisting on sitting with him at lunch, and now dinner, as if he were a beloved grandfather. Rendy couldn't understand it. Story? Pei Yi asked as she brought the teapot to the table. Like this morning's story about the suns? Yes, Madame Chang said to her. But she was looking quietly again at Mr. Shan. Have the old stories been forgotten already? Mr. Shan stared back again in his confused way and said senselessly, I lost the book. Randy swallowed an annoyed sigh. Mr. Shan was getting more witless every day. I want to hear it, Pei Yi said. Rendy was eager as well, for there had been few tales told in the dull inn of clear sky, but he flushed when he saw Madame Chang looking directly at him. Would you like to hear it? she asked. Rendy tried to shrug indifferently. I guess so, he said. The Story of the Rooster's Song after Wang Yi shot down five of the six suns, the last sun fled from the sky. In fear, it hid inside a tall mountain. Now, instead of boiling and burning, the people had another problem. The moon still floated in the sky, and its light made it possible for the villagers to see dimly, but it was not enough to warm the earth. The villagers huddled together as the plants and trees began to freeze. The sun must come out, Wang Yi said. Everyone agreed, but what could they do? They went to the mountain where the sun was hiding, and threatened and pleaded and bribed to no avail. The sun refused to come out. But just as they began to despair, the wind murmured a message. A friendly call will bring out the sun, the spirit of the mountain whispered. A friendly call. What did the spirit of the mountain mean? A friendly call? The villagers had tried sweet words and pleasant voices already, and the sun had not budged. It was Wang Yi's wife who understood. The sun does not consider us friends. It will not answer our call, she said. We must find something that the sun thinks sounds friendly. First they brought out the cricket, which had a pleasant chirp, but its sound was faint, 
and the sun could not hear it through the stone of the mountain. So then they brought out the tiger, whose loud, angry roars echoed across the land. But the sound enraged the sun, and it spit fire in annoyance. They decided then to bring out the cow. Its relaxed lows were sure to be calming to the sun, and they were. The sun inside the mountain was lulled by the cow's sound and almost went to sleep. The villagers began to panic. What sound will call out the sun? They asked themselves. What will sound friendly to it? Let us try the rooster, Wang Yi's wife said. The rooster? The others said dubious. Most found the rooster's voice to be grating and strident. It is loud enough to be heard through the stone, she said and his voice is not full of anger or leisure. Let us try the rooster. So they brought out the rooster, which gave its loud, triumphant crow. The sun listened carefully. What a nice noise, it thought, and it peeked out of the mountain to see who was calling. The sun's first rays reached out and touched the rooster. In its light, the rooster turned a radiant golden color, with a comb as bright and as red as a burning flame. When the villagers saw this, they realized the sun was coming out, and they cheered as if it was a grand celebration. The sun, now hearing so many friendly sounds, was pleased, and it came all the way out of the mountain. That is how the sun returned to the sky. But the rooster, the one that turned gold, was it special then? Pei Yi asked. Yes. Madam Chang said, nodding. It became the celestial rooster, and it is the sun's friendly companion to this day. And is this why the roosters crow in the morning? Randy couldn't help asking. He was thinking about Widow Yan's rooster, which woke him up every morning just as the night stopped its moaning and he was able to fall asleep. He disliked that rooster very much. Yes, Madam Chang said, giving him a pleased smile. The roosters are calling out the sun, just like the celestial rooster did a long time ago. A long time ago, Mr. Shan echoed unexpectedly. For a moment, Randy saw a flicker in his eyes, a sharp brightness he had never seen before. But then it disappeared, and Mr. Shan slurped from his bowl, dribbles of soup falling into his beard. Chapter 8 at night, the sky remained moonless, and the mournful sounds, as much as he tried to ignore them, kept Rendy awake in his bed. He gritted his teeth in frustration. How many nights had the sky wailed? How long had he been in this village? Would a new guest ever come? But a new guest had come. For a moment, Rendy stopped his usual glowering and started to think about Madame Chang. She had brought no cart for him to hide in, but she had brought stories, and when she told them, Rendy had felt transported, away from the village and inn he despised, and from unwanted memories. He remembered Madame Chang looking at him with that pleased, almost tender smile. It had been a smile that a mother would give her child, and it filled Rendy with a longing that made him turn and sigh in his bed, almost as much as the groaning sky. Oh, <sighs> A muffled whine blended into the howls of the sky, but this moan had no eerie echo and came from right outside Rendy's room. He rose from his bed and opened the door to see Pei huddled in the doorway of her room, across the way with a lantern. It's so dark, Pei said. The stars don't really shine, and the moon is gone. Did she hear the wails? Was it not just in his head? Rendy began to ask, but then looked at Pei's small, upturned face. As her frightened eyes met his, he saw the start of tears forming. A wavering softness seemed to curl inside Rendy, like smoke from incense. Pei reminded him so much of... The memory stung him with a slapping pain. Rendy scowled. You probably just scared it away with your drippy pig nose, he said. Fear disappeared from Pei's face as anger replaced it. Horrible! You don't care about anything, she said, her white cheeks turning red with rage. Everyone else leaves. Why won't you? Pei, why aren't you sleeping? Master Chao's voice called from the stairs. As he came into view, 
Randy felt himself flush. And you too, Randy? We were just, Randy began, but Master Chow cut him short. Go to bed, Master Chow said, both of you. They nodded, and Randy silently retreated to his room. However, inside he was seething and wanted to scream with the sky. Everyone else leaves. Why won't you? Pei Yi had said. He would leave if he could, if only a guest with a carriage or cart would come. It wouldn't matter where it was headed. Any place would be better than here. Any place but here, Randy thought. Or home. But it was here he was stuck. The next morning brought the rooster's crow, the hot sun, and a new chore. But no new guests. Randy sagged at the table at breakfast. That old well in the back dried up for good last week, Master Chow said. And now it's falling apart. I don't want a guest taking a night stroll to fall into it. Rendy, you'd better fill it up this morning. Fill it? Rendy asked. I guess it's the first well in the village to go dry, Master Chow said. If something doesn't change, there'll be more. Pretty soon, all the villagers will have to get their water from the half-moon well like we do. Pei Yi will show you where the shovel is. Moments later, with the shovel on his shoulder, Randy followed Pei Yi as she crossed the yard with skipping leaps. The sun seemed to be rising up into the sky by jumps and leaps as well, because the top of Randy's head felt as if it were smoldering. Full of resentment, he thought of shaded pavilions and cool iced plum juice brought by bowing servants. What am I doing here? Randy glared in disgust as he slowly began to dig the crumbly earth. The ground was surprisingly soft and light, and without any heavy rocks or stones. More like dust than dirt, Randy thought. He looked across to the barren plain of stone left by the missing mountain. I guess all the stone is there. As Randy dropped a shovelful of dirt into the well, it seemed to scatter down like drops of water being shaken from a tree after the rain. But as the earth fell, a strange, deep sound began to echo. Rip, rip, groaned the well. Rendy, Peggy said as she threw herself on the ground and peered into the deep hole. There's something in there. Chapter 9 Rendy kneeled and looked into the hole. Peggy was right. There was something there. In the blackness at the bottom, two beady eyes looked at him. Rip, it croaked up. Randy almost laughed. It was a toad. It was an old, ugly, warty toad sitting on a rock in a dark puddle of water. The toad moaned again, reminding Randy of the mournful sounds that kept him up at night. Was it this toad that had been making the whales in the sky? Impossible. Those sounds bellowed in his ears like loud thunder. This toad's croak was at most a faded echo. It's just a dumb old toad, Randy said, and threw in another heap of dirt. The toad groaned again. Stop, Peggy said, jumping up. You'll kill it. I'm not killing it, Randy said, irritated. I'm filling the well. I'm doing what your father told me to do. Randy tossed in another pile of dirt, and rip, rip, the toad wailed over and over again, as if now realizing what was happening. The cries were like the sounds of a funeral horn. Stop it! Stop it! Peggy screamed, grabbing his arm. You'll bury it alive! Who cares? Randy sneered and pushed away Peggy's hands. The sun was scorching his head and arms, and he was burning inside as well. He didn't care about anything in this hot, dried-up village. If he could, he would bury all of it, everything, anything to make his past— the crying night, and the village of clear sky disappear. What is wrong? Madame Chang said, her gentle voice blowing over him. As he and Pei turned around, Randy again felt as if they should kowtow on the ground before her. She stood there, gracefully, her dark eyes gazing down upon them, and Randy felt ashamed. Randy has to fill the old well, but there's a toad down there, Pei said in a pleading tone. If he fills it, he'll kill the toad. I see, Madam Chang said. Careless of the fabric of her silver-gray robe, she kneeled beside the old well, looked in, and smiled. Too hot for fur, she said to the toad. 
Fei gave Randy a confused look, and he shrugged. The toad continued its melancholy song, and Randy wondered what Madame Chang would do. The well was too deep for her to reach the toad, even with a stick. Would she ask him to get a rope and climb down? He cringed. The decrepit old well was cracking and breaking. It was likely that part of the well would collapse with him in it. Suddenly, the toad was silent. Madame Chang stood up. You can continue your work, Rendy, she said. But if he fills the well, the toad... Pei sputtered, torn between her manners for a guest and her feelings. Don't worry, Madame Chang said, gently putting her hand on Pei's shoulder and leading her away. The toad will be fine. Pei looked doubtful, but as she continued to look at Madame Chang, her expression slowly cleared and transformed into one of puppy-like adoration. If Pei had admired pretty Melan as a lady, she was now worshipping Madame Chang like a queen. Rendy stared at their backs as they both walked away. In silence, he shoveled earth into the well. Madame Chang's appearance had been like a soft wind cooling his anger, and now Rendy began to feel troubled. Each drop of earth weighed upon his conscience. Was he killing the old toad? Why was the well quiet? Had the toad found another way out? Or was it dead already? Finally, Rendy looked over the edge. His mouth fell open. He couldn't believe what he saw. The toad was sitting cheerfully on a pile of dirt, the same dirt that Rendy was flinging into the well. Rendy tossed in another mound and then watched as the toad shook it off and vigorously jumped, patting the earth down into a surface. The toad was making a hill from the dirt that was filling the well. With each shovelful Rendy threw in, the toad rose higher. So Rendy continued to dig. His hands were chafed raw, and he had been obliged to dig farther and farther away from the well in order to not create another hole. The sun made his head feel as if it were a burning blister, and sweat dripped from his brow like a melting icicle. Finally, the toad was getting closer to the top of the well. Now Rendy could see it sitting attentively on the dirt pile, its brownish-green warts making it look like a piece of rotten wood covered with mushrooms. The toad's black eyes were flashing in eagerness. Just when it was high enough for the toad to see out of the well, it gathered itself like an expectant warrior. With one last shake, the ugly, ancient toad gave a bellowing croak, a war cry, and with a powerful leap, jumped onto solid ground next to Rendy's feet. Rip! The toad burped. Chapter 10 The toad looked up at Rendy triumphantly, as if expecting applause. Rendy could only stare. The toad gave another burp, this one sounding a bit offended. It turned away from Rendy and began to gaze at the stone field. It sat listening to the light breeze, its neck strained forward, as if a voice was calling to it. Rendy looked at the toad again. It seemed ordinary enough, mold-colored, fat, and lumpy. If anything, it was uglier than most toads. But Rendy had never seen a toad act like this. Then, with a clumsy plop, the toad jumped. Hop, plop. It began to make its way toward the stone pancake. It was easy to see that the toad meant to cross it. Rendy quickly moved. Don't go there, you dumb toad. Rendy said, placing the shovel in front of its path. It's miles of hot stone. You'll just get lost and cooked. The toad made another insulted-sounding croak, but looked again at Rendy as if reconsidering. Rendy felt curious and impressed at the same time. Then, as if a decision had been made, the toad turned around and hopped to the back door of the inn. Rip, the toad said loudly. Did you want to go in? Rendy asked. Rip, rip, the toad said impatiently. It's lunchtime anyway, Rendy shrugged and opened the door. The toad began to hop into the inn. Rendy couldn't help following, matching his steps to the toad's jumps. Where was it going? He felt as if he were tied to the toad with an invisible thread. The toad turned toward a room Rendy had never entered before. I don't think you should go in there, toad, Rendy said. But the toad was not listening. He disappeared into the room, and Rendy, after hesitating a moment, 
followed. It was a small, dark room, and the light from the doorway poured into it like spilled water. The harsh daylight was softened, diffused by the dusty ashes of incense floating in the air. It skimmed gently over the short, narrow table, lined with incense holders and the row of gray slabs of stone that leaned against the wall. The stone tablets were carved with names of dead ancestors and blackened by smoke. This was the Chow family's shrine room. The toad plopped before a tablet and gave a sad, mournful croak, again reminding Rendy of the sad cries he heard from the night sky. Rendy stepped closer and caught his breath as he read the name of Pei's mother. He hadn't really thought about Pei's mother until that moment, he realized, and a sudden guilt filled him. Everyone leaves, Pei had said, and she had meant her mother as well. However, Pei's mother had not only left, but was also never coming back. All that Pei saw of her mother now was a carved name on a cold, dark stone. Rip, the toad said. Brendy saw that the toad was leaving the room. He followed. The toad turned into the hallway, leaping confidently. Rendy felt his amusement returning. Hop, plop, hop, plop. Each jump gave a resolute thud, and the toad continued forward with a determined air. As they got closer to the dining room, Rendy could hear people talking. He's always angry. He doesn't care about anyone except himself. He hasn't ever smiled or laughed or been nice since he's been here, Pei was saying. Never smiled, Madam Chang said thoughtfully. He's too young to be that troubled. Rendy realized they were talking about him and tried to retreat, but it was too late. Rip, rip, the toad called loudly, announcing their presence. Everyone turned toward them, and Rendy froze in the entryway. But no one was looking at Rendy. All eyes were on the toad. Despite Master Chow's look of horror, it was gleefully leaping across the floor, making croaking sounds like guffaws of laughter. With a last great joyful spring, the toad bounded into the air and onto Mr. Shan's ragged, unkempt lap. <laughs>